On the 31st of October, 1517, in a small university town located in a backwater part of Europe, an Augustinian friar who worked as a lecturer in a university nailed a piece of paper to a church door. Little did he know that this act was to spark off a revolution and the world would have to choose sides. Today, 16,154 uh, kilometres away uh, from Wittenberg and 500, almost three years afterwards, that fairly simple act still grabs our attention. Why? Well, these monumental changes all happened because of a change within Martin Luther himself while at that university. You see, as he read and taught from the Bible, a whole new world opened up for him. In 1513 to 14, as he lectured on the Psalms, he did it in a new way. He had the Psalms uh, printed off with large marginal space around the edges for students to write notes in next to the text of God's Word. See, until then, lecturers would often have just merely repeated the comments of other theologians as they worked through the text of the Bible. But Luther wanted his students to start from the Bible and work outwards, not the other way around. So 1515, note that's before Erasmus's Greek New Testament even, Luther lectured on the book of Romans and here he saw not only the great importance of God's word, but he discovered something about God's grace, something new. He said that while he sat there with the Bible opened in front of him, in his private study, this revelation about God's grace struck him like a thunderbolt. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words, namely, in it the righteousness of God is revealed, as it is written, he who through faith is righteous, shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and entered paradise itself through open gates. Thus in that place in Paul was for me truly the gate to paradise. In other words, Luther discovered that we're justified before God by faith alone. Let's just ponder that for a second. We're accepted by God, not because of our strenuous efforts or because of our priest's sacramental efforts, but only because of Christ's sacrificial effort on our behalf. And that's the good news of the gospel, not what man can do to save himself, but what Jesus has done to save mankind. And it was a total game changer for Luther, um, whereas he previously would have written his uh, surname with the German Luder, L-U-D-E-R, he now started to write it with a Latinized Greek word, Eleutherius, the freed one. And from then on, it just became Luther, the forgiven and freed Martin Luther. He was a new creation. But while this was taking place in Wittenberg, there was another creation taking place in Rome. And it's a very different kind of creation. We might know it today as St. Peter's Basilica. But at that time, it was still under construction and Pope Leo X desperately needed the cash to build it. And he found a source of cash in the wealthy nobleman Albrecht of Brandenburg. At the age of 23, Albrecht was already the Archbishop of Magdeburg, but he also wanted to become the Archbishop of Mainz. And in those days, the wealthy could collect Episcopal sees like a game of Monopoly. Now, Pope Leo made a deal with Albrecht. He'd give the dispensation for the second archbishopric if Albrecht copped up the cash for St. Peter's. Well, Albrecht did bring the cash, but how? Well, by selling indulgences to people in his churches. But what were these indulgences? Indulgences were ways for Christians to fast-track their time through purgatory. The teaching of the Roman Catholic Church was, and still is, that Christ granted the Pope a treasury of merit, which the Pope could then dispense out of his mercy. So if you bought an indulgence from the Pope, you could obtain some merits from Christ and pass through purgatory at a quicker rate. Here's an example from St. Michael's Church in Macclesfield in England, still there today. Roger Lee, who died on the 4th of November, 1506, was granted 26,000 years and 20 
six days off purgatory by the Pope on the condition that he said the Lord's Prayer five times and, uh, and did a couple of other things. And there's more examples you could find in the 1968 Papal Handbook for Indulgences, for instance. But let's come back to the Luther story. The Pope got his cash from Albrecht. Albrecht got his cash from selling those indulgences. And the Dominican friar, Johann Tetzel, was sent out as the leading promoter of those indulgences. And he travelled around Saxon Germany saying, amongst other things, when a penny in my box rings, a soul from purgatory springs. So the beautiful St Peter's Basilica was built on the grotesque idea of selling indulgences and buying time off purgatory. It was an ugly business. And Luther knew that. He was incensed by the greed of the Roman Catholic Church and the trivialising of salvation, so he protested. He wrote 95 statements, theses, the 95 theses, part of the protest, a process of a disputation, attacking indulgences, and he nailed them to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. It was a really bold and articulate attack on the system of salvation in the Roman Catholic Church, and he specifically called out the abuses he saw around him. Any true Christian, whether living or dead, he says, participates in all the blessings of Christ in the church, and this is granted him by God, even without indulgences. Luther asked rhetorically, if the Pope had the power to spring some people out of purgatory, why doesn't he simply spring all people and do it justly without the money of poor Christians? For Luther, getting it right with God was not through human efforts, and especially not through the corrupt system of indulgences. Getting right with God was through faith in Christ alone. Now, the impact of Luther's disputation was like dynamite. Although it was merely written just to initiate dialogue with the church about abuses, it was printed over and over and over again, and it spread with throughout Europe within months. It was a call to arms against the pretended authority of the church and for the actual authority of the Bible. Indeed, over the course of the next few years, Luther had a number of theological battles which grew successively in terms of importance and danger. In 1518, Luther travelled to Heidelberg where he defended a new set of statements, theses, among the leading theologians of his Augustinian order. Here, some of Luther's classic theological themes are articulated. The condemning function of the law, the bondage of the human will, the hiddenness and revealedness of God in Jesus, and other beautiful reflections we commonly associate with Luther. Many hoped that Luther would be silenced by losing this debate, but the opposite happened. He swept the floor and convinced many hearers of his views, including notable future reformers, Wolfgang Capito, Johannes Brenz, and a young man who would later make his mark on the English Reformation as Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge, Martin Butzer. After Heidelberg, Luther was a marked man. His 95 theses were declared heretical, and he was summoned to Rome for a trial that could have led him to the stake. But in the Lord's kindness and because of the Pope's desire to secure German support against the, the war against the Ottoman Turks, the summons was uh, modified to just an appearance before the papal legate in Augsburg. Now, the papal legate was Dominican Tomasa de Vere, known as Cardinal Cayetan, a serious churchman who, and scholar who mocked Luther's arguments and continued to condescendingly call him my son. Caetan's task was not to debate Luther, but to simply make him say, revoco, I have recant. Now, Luther heeded the wisdom of his friends, and so he prostrated himself before the cardinal and rose up to his knees to answer. And throughout those three meetings, Luther and Caetan clashed. Discussions ended after Luther thoroughly embarrassed the powerful Italian ecclesiastic with his superior knowledge of Latin and the history of the popes. Luther even appealed to a general council, which was then forbidden after a 1460 papal bull. And now his supporters from Augsburg were so concerned for his safety that they urged him to leave town immediately, and he apparently climbed over the city walls to escape. 
Now, whereas Luther's discussion with Kiatan was like talking to a father figure, Luther's next debate in Leipzig was a battle between brothers. Johann Eck was Luther's equal. An aggressive and ambitious scholar, Eck was really familiar with theological debate and had a track record of just demolishing his opponents. Luther probably should have known better. But in 1519, he locked horns with Eck and he came off second best. The main bone of contention between Luther and Eck was whether the power of the Pope could be found in the Bible or only in the imagination of men. And Eck lured Luther into agreeing that the bohemian Jan Hus was right. Papal power was an accretion that needed to be jettisoned. But having one's theological position in agreement with a condemned heretic was not a good look, and it seemed to all present that Luther had lost. However, the University of Paris and Erfurt were to make the official judgment on the debate, but they dragged their feet, uh, and it took them about two years to decide. In the meantime, a massive publication war broke out between Luther's supporters and his opponents. Firstly, the pamphlets concerned who won the Leipzig debate. But secondly, they moved into a sharply polemical and theological uh, uh, arguments. Luther and his theological views had now become ubiquitous throughout Europe. In fact, between 1518 and 1525, his German publications exceeded those of the 17 next most prolific authors put together. Indeed, between 1500 and 1530, Luther alone was responsible for 20% of all the works published in German printing presses. Unsurprisingly, Pope Leo X issued a papal bull condemning Luther as a heretic in June of 1520, and he was given six months to recant. Yet Luther responded defiantly. His Augustinian superior, Johann von Staupitz, advised him not to say anything, but to consider the seriousness of the charge. But Luther, he published three very explosive treatises. The first one is the Address to the Christian Nobility, written to the encourage lay people, uh, the lay governing elite of the uh, empire, to throw off the shackles of papal power. Secondly, the Babylonian captivity of the church, and this was a bomb set to explode Roman Catholic theology written for the clergy. And the third, the freedom of the Christian, written to positively outline his theology, it contains some of his famous paradoxes like, a Christian is the perfectly free Lord of all and subject to none. But a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. To give an example of how electrifying the atmosphere in Europe was at the time, his address to the nobility had 4,000 copies printed in the first run, and they sold out within a fortnight. And to give an example of how electrifying things were in Wittenberg itself, well, on the 10th of December, 1520, the remaining time left to recant ran out. Luther finished his lecture at the university, went out into the middle of Wittenberg, his students lit a huge bonfire and Luther threw the papal bull into the flames, proclaiming, because you saddened the holiness of the Lord, may so may the eternal fire destroy you. If you thought things couldn't have got any worse for Martin Luther at this stage, you'd be wrong. He was summoned before the most powerful man on the planet, with the exception of the Chinese emperor, of course. And this was the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. It was the year 1521, and Martin Luther appeared in the city of Worms for a meeting, the name of which continues to cause children and theological students to giggle ever since, the Diet of Worms, pronounced Worms. You see, here was an, uh, the lowly Augustinian friar from a peasant family standing before the most famous most wealthy and most militarily powerful man he could imagine. And with his books presented on the table in the middle of the room, he was asked just two questions. Firstly, whether he'd written them. And secondly, whether he'd recant. He answered yes to the first and to the second, he asked for an adjournment to think. And so he came back the next day. The crowd hushed and Luther replied at length, finishing with the famous words, Unless I'm convinced by the testimony of scriptures or by clear reason 
for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known they've often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand, so help me God. Amen. Pandemonium broke out after the meeting concluded and a large crowd followed Luther, hurling abuses at him, saying, burn, burn, burn. Luther was now in some danger. The emperor promised him safe conduct, but others remembered Jan Hus, and they worried if Luther's safety could even be trusted. He left Worms, and he was kidnapped on the way home. Fortunately, however, his kidnapper was his friend, the elector Frederick the Wise of Saxony, who took him and safely hid him away in the Wartburg Castle. And from the silence and solitude here in the castle, Luther wrote his most important work of theology, a German translation of the Bible. An astonishing work completed in 11 weeks and perfectly translated for the common man. They had short, pithy, effective sentences. And he spent almost the next year tucked away in the Wartburg Castle, but the spark that he'd lit had spread like wildfire throughout Germany and beyond. The Reformation had well and truly commenced. Well, thus far in the story, we see Luther, the revolutionary, the working class friar who hated the corrupt elites that controlled the church and who loved the Bible's beautiful teaching about how to be accepted and forgiven and justified by God. With this rediscovery of justification by faith alone, he destroyed the two pillars of the Roman Catholic Church. The idea of purgatory was chopped down because one could now stand perfectly forgiven before God and the idea of papal power was chopped down because it had strayed enormously from God's teaching about the church in the Bible. It was now Luther contra mundum, Luther against the world. 